support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89. And welcome to Arkansas Week. I'm Dawn Scott. Thank you so much for being here with us. Did Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders' signature education overhaul take effect immediately after being passed by the legislature earlier this year? Well, that's up to the Arkansas Supreme Court to now decide. As we record this mid-morning Friday, no ruling has been issued. Briefs were filed this week in the lawsuit brought by 11 Phillips County residents and two public school advocates who claim that because of a procedural mistake while voting on the Learns Act, an emergency clause was not properly approved. A hearing is scheduled for June 20th, and that is where we will begin today. Joining me, Antoinette Grajeda. She is the senior reporter for the Arkansas Advocate. And we have with us Josie Lenora, political and government reporter for Little Rock Public Radio Station, KUAR FM 89.1. Thank you both for being here. You all have extensively reported not only on the Learns Act, but the referendum and the lawsuits that have followed. So let's start uh, with you, Josie. If someone is just joining us, they're not really clear what the Learns Act is or what it does, let's give a refresher. I think there's three big parts of the Learns Bill that I try to focus on when I explain it to people. The first one is what's called the Education Freedom Accounts. There's a reluctance to use the term vouchers, but basically it would be, it's a giant pool of money that we can give to parents who are interested in sending their kid to a private school so they can enroll them in a school of their choice. A lot of uh, public school advocates don't like that because some private schools aren't subjected to free and reduced lunch, transportation requirements, the Arkansas Americans with Disabilities Act. So that's sort of one of the big controversial pieces of the bill. The second part is it raises minimum teacher salaries to about $50,000 a year. And the third part is that it allows struggling school districts to be inter and transformational contracts with charter schools. Talk more about the teacher pay to begin with. Uh, it raises their pay to $50,000, which seems like a win for teachers. But what does it do to the veteran teachers? And what does it do to the power of the school districts to say, hey, we have to give them raises or we don't have to give them raises. It's their choice is my understanding. Right, so with the LEARNS Act, um, we had a statewide minimum salary schedule. So setting like if you work 10 years, you get this, 15 years, and so on and so forth. And, and school districts could go above and beyond if they so chose, but there was that minimum. The LEARNS Act got rid of that. And the governor recently talked about that this week where she's like, well, we're giving them more flexibility so they can choose what's best for them. Part of the controversy with the teacher pay raise, because as you mentioned, you know, people should be excited, right? We get mm -hmm. more money. Well, a new teacher coming straight out of school is gonna get $50,000 and someone who's been working 15 years could be getting also $50,000 unless the uh, district decides to give them more. But now it's up to the district how much that they want to do. There's not a set minimum or mm -hmm. a set, uh, minimum for those steps. Really gives them local control. It gives it local control for sure. And I know the controversy surrounding the money that's being given to families to go to private school. There's a whole host of issues with that. What about the, the parents who pay in full for private schools? What does that do to the privatization of schools here in Arkansas? What's interesting about the education freedom accounts is the design is that they will go first to military families, homeless families, those who are most financially in need, and then it will spread out. But there is kind of this question about at what point does it stop? Is there going to be enough for everybody that wants it? And could that money be better spent in the public school system? And I've heard a lot about the charter schools taking over distressed schools. And what are the reasons, what are the good and bad of, of that in y'all's opinion? Well, through the transformation contract, it's not a takeover necessarily. It's um, more that they are are allowed to run the day-to-day -day, um, activities of the district. It's not necessarily um, a charter school, it could be a third party. So under the transformation contract, it allows the struggling district to partner with a third party and it's an alternative to being taken over by the state, right? Where states come in and they take over and they lose that local control. So through this transformation contract, they can partner with say a charter organization mm -hmm. um, to come in and do the day-to-day -day work, which is what's happening in Marvel Elaine. So Marvel Elaine is a district in Phillips County that was already consolidated once um, because of uh, low enrollment. It's a really rural area and we had, um, we have a law where, you know, if you are uh, less than 350 oh, for two consecutive years that you consolidate and the legislature adjusted some of that and took 
care of that, and that'll eventually go into law this year, um, where that's not an issue anymore. But Marvel Elaine found itself in the position where they were looking to um, be consolidated a second time this year, and mm -hmm. they were doing what they could to save the school and keep it open. There are two schools in the district, and, and they could be consolidated, but all the nearby ones were also struggling districts. Students were going to be on the bus for you know more than 40 miles one way. Um, and that was just a lot of things that people didn't want. So when the LEARNS Act passed, they pointed to this transformation contract and they asked, is this something that we could do? So in April, the State Board of Education um, decided to uh, give them a waiver, grant them a waiver for this 350 and allow them to stay open. And uh, they put Secretary Edu Education Secretary Jacob Oliva over the school district. And so he was able to um, pursue this transformation contract. In May, they were able to, uh, the State Board of Education had a special meeting and they approved uh, the pursuit of this transformation contract. So it's the first one in the state between Marvel Elaine and a charter management organization, the um, Friendship Education Foundation. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we have now ended up in a lawsuit. In a lawsuit. In a lawsuit. I, was, <laughs> I was moving to the legal challenges <laughs> the legal because challenge. there's a lot to, to cover here. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, we're, we've covered the background, but Attorney General Tim Griffin filed responses for the state. How did the attorney for the plaintiffs, Ali Noland, respond to Griffin? Let's get into what, what's going on here. She's arguing that the law wasn't voted on in the legislature correctly. There was an emergency clause tacked on to learns initially, which means that the law would go into effect immediately. I was there. It's on video. They they voted on the emergency clause and the bill at the same time. Under the plain language of the Arkansas Constitution, those two things should be voted on separately, but that's not customarily how it's done. So there is this interesting thought experiment at play if, if the Supreme Court were to rule that the, the, the emergency clause and the bill should be voted on separately. What would that say about the hundreds of other laws that have been voted on with an emergency clause? Right. It, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. If the judge rules in favor of the plaintiffs, though, that lawmakers didn't properly vote on the emergency clause, would Learns Act then become law? Do you think so, in, in the standard 91 days after the, ste the session? So potentially. So there's a lot of things at play here. So right now we're waiting to hear um, from the Supreme Court. Uh, they could be ruling right now, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. So what has happened is in this lawsuit that Nolan filed um, following this uh, transformation contract, um, alleging that this is they didn't have the, the authority to do this because the law is not yet in effect because of this defective emergency clause. Mm -hmm. So. On the 26th, May 26th, a Pulaski County Circuit Court judge issued a temporary restraining order. And that is what is being challenged currently. Um, the, the state filed an appeal, and then um, the Supreme Court d denied the motion to stay the, the uh, temporary restraining order, which has temporarily blocked the law in its totality, not just, not just the transformation contract, but the whole law. So this past week, um, the Supreme Court did grant the request from the Attorney General to uh, have an expedited review. So that's why I've been filing these briefs right now. So while these briefs are filing, they've been filed by both parties. We're waiting for the Supreme Court to decide, okay, yes, we'll keep the temporary restraining order or no. If they keep it, then the law remains paused until this hearing on June 20th. Now, June 20th, if the judge um, rules in favor of the plaintiffs, then yes, Yes, but. Yes, the but. Law, yes, but. <laughs> the law will uh, again be um, stay on pause and would, in theory, not go into effect until August 1st. However, it's my understanding that the state could then again appeal that decision. So we could come back to another appeals process okay. where the Supreme Court has to decide that part again. Because right now they're just looking at the temporary restraining order. Mm -hmm. Well, on Tuesday night, Governor Sanders and Education Secretary Jacob Oliva held another town hall meeting on the implementation of the LEARNS Act, this time in El Dorado. And after a question from an audience member addressed this court challenge. Take a listen. We feel confident that there will be a ruling uh, in the near future, and we feel very solid about our case and the Attorney General representing us uh, that we will win in the Supreme Court. Uh, we have um, to go through that process. The good news is, is LEARNS is going to go into effect regardless of what happens. It just depends on the timing of whether that happens in the next few days or the next couple of weeks. But this is a piece of legislation that was overwhelmingly passed in the legislature and the court does not have the ability to block it completely. One of the unfortunate setbacks with 
the restraining order is we planned on the application for families and school districts to go live on June 1st. So we had to put a pause on that. So the second we get all of this noise settled, we're gonna be ready to uh, hit the ground running because we know parents are making decisions about where they wanna send their children to school now, if, if not already. And uh, some of that may be a little bit uh, held in abeyance, but it's just delaying the inevitable. We're gonna have the system up and running. We're gonna have everything in place and we're gonna make sure to support those choice opportunities for the families that you serve. What is your reaction to, to hearing that? I don't see a scenario where the governor doesn't keep pushing this legislation or something similar, no matter what happens in the courts. She hasn't said that she would do this, but there's nothing to stop her from calling a special session or passing something similar in the future. Um, I know that the governor has really campaigned on this legislation. It's really important to her. So I, I can't imagine a future where something like Learns doesn't go into effect. And with the education freedom accounts, that's been a big um, push for them as well, a big piece of this. Um, Secretary Oliva in an affidavit in the lawsuit had said, you know, we were set to roll this out and open up applications on June 1st, but because of this temporary restraining order, we had to pause everything. And if this keeps going on, there is a possibility where this may not be ready for this first year and they would have to push it back a year. And there's other parts of the law too that they would be concerned that because there's so much, it's a 145 page document and there's so many different provisions, there are still lots of rules and regulations and policies that have to be developed in order for these things to be ready to go for the next school year. So with these laws, this lawsuit, there's a possibility that things like the Education Freedom Account just won't be available this first year. Mm -hmm. Well, as we heard from the governor just a moment ago, the administration says, if anything, this is only a delay and that they are continuing the steps of implementing LEARNS, as we've just discussed. And here's another cut from Tuesday's town hall meeting with Governor Sanders and Secretary Oliva discussing just how they're preparing for the homeschooling aspect of this plan. Homeschool families have the ability to opt in to the education freedom accounts if they choose to do so. It's certainly not required, but if a family decides that educating their kid at home is the best option for them and they would like to participate in the education freedom accounts, they can do so. However, there will be some accountability measures that are in place that they have to agree uh, that they're willing to participate in a standardized test similar to what we would have uh, at one of the public or charter or private schools that also are participating in the program. Uh, in addition to that, it's I think one of the things that's important for people to understand, it's not like the government is going to send that family a check, but we will cover uh, things like curriculum or uh, textbooks, but it wouldn't be a blank check that a family can take and uh, the secretary likes to use the example by a PlayStation and call that an educational tool. It would actually have to be something that uh, is specific for educating the child and um, the government would then cover the cost in that direction, but not just a open-ended check. Uh, but again, that is something that a family would have to opt in and make the decision that they wanted to participate in on the front end. Yeah, and I think it goes to the notion that we know that a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't meet the need of all students and families. Number one, the, the primary goal of the LEARNS initiative is to improve the neighborhood schools. And investing in the public school system is the number one priority of this educational initiative. There's value in, in lifting up zip codes. A lot of times students are, are going able to go to school and learn with their friends and their peers. A lot of time their parents went to the same school and their parents and their parents went to the same school and, and multiple generations have a value and vested interest. But if that school is not able to meet an individual's needs, then parents should be empowered to have choices. And those choices need to be choices of quality and those choices need to have some kind of accountability around them. And that's what um, the LEARNS bill does. It's not gonna go into place for the homeschool families in the upcoming school year, so say for the 23-24 school year, because there's gonna be a lot of guardrails and rules that are gonna be developed around that. So that takes time to get that process right and outline how that's gonna exactly work. But we would be on track for full implementation for the 24-25 school year. So for, for families that are interested in that, stay tuned. We have a LEARNS portal that we've established. It's really easy. It's learns at uh, ade.arkansas.gov where we update all of our latest information. So we, we want to be clear and transparent throughout that process. All right, Antoinette, Josie, how do you react to that? You've covered this for many months. What are your thoughts hearing that? It's 
it just further illustrates the point that there are a lot of things to still figure out about the law and how it will be implemented. And you know, I, um, a lot of that won't be answered until we get an answer on these lawsuits this summer. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about the referendum. The Attorney General certified the ballot language for a proposed referendum to repeal the, the LEARNS Act, and that clears the way for CAPES or the Citizens for Arkansas Public Education and students to gather signatures. Uh, you know, it makes it the longest ballot title for a referendum in, in state history. What are the challenges of this? They have a lot of challenges. They have a long road to hoe, and there's not a lot of room for error. So they need to get over 54,000 signatures, and they have about 50 days. So it's easy to do the math. They need to get at least a couple thousand a day. And sometimes those uh, signatures aren't verified. So I, last time I talked to Steve Graff, he said he wanted to get 90,000 signatures. None so, of the chair of the organization. Yes. yes. And that's a long way to go. And even then, it will just go on the ballot for November of 2024. So there's a chance people could have warmed up to the bill by then or people might not vote for it. So they have a long way to go. And they've got over 54,000 that they have to get, but where they have to get it from has been more of a challenge now as well. There's a new law that went into effect this session that increased uh, the amount of places that you have to get it from. So previously, you had to collect signatures from 15 counties. Now that's up to 50. So two thirds of our 75 counties in Arkansas is where you have to collect those from. And this law also is being challenged. Yeah. Um, a Senate uh, Senator Brian King and the Arkansas um, League of Women Voters filed a lawsuit against this particular law saying it's unconstitutional. Um, the state has filed a motion to dismiss and we are awaiting a ruling on that as well. Final thoughts as we close out this segment. I think some version of learns or learns is probably going to become law in the future, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, I know CAPES is very confident that they're going to be able to stop the law. It's just been really interesting to sort of see um, everything play out in the, in, in the courts and, and the law process and just really like we talked about it being a really interesting thought experiment like if this then that. If we, if the court invalidates for example the emergency clause, what does that mean for the hundreds of other laws that were passed in a similar manner this session and what does that mean going forward for the way that um, lawmakers approve these types of things during a legislative session? Mm -hmm. Ever changing, even as we sit here, we don't know what's coming. All right, Antoinette Grajeda, senior reporter for the Arkansas Advocate, and Josie Lenora, political reporter for Little Rock Public Radio Station KUAR FM 89.1. Thank you both so much for your explanations and thoughts. We do appreciate you. And we'll be back with Good Roots. Major funding for Good Roots is provided by Arkansas Farm Bureau. I'm Lauren McCullough, and this is Good Roots. Agritourism is a field that is growing in popularity as producers try to diversify and increase profits. Simply stated, agritourism connects agricultural production with tourism to attract visitors onto a farm, a ranch, or any other business for the purposes of entertaining and educating those visitors. In this episode, we'll visit two locations here in Arkansas and find out what makes them unique and how they plan to keep visitors coming back. Our first stop, Subiaco Abbey. Monks have long been responsible for making and keeping alive some of the world's most exciting food traditions, and the ones here at Subiaco are no exception. Subiaco Abbey has existed since 1878, relatively young compared to the medieval monasteries of Europe, but no less traditional. It's a Benedictine monastery, a sect known for its traditions of growing, cooking, and eating. My name is Father Richard Walls. I am a monk of Subiaco Abbey. We have a combination between the solitary life and the active apostolic life. We are open to the community. We have a high school for boys. We also have a retreat center, so a good number of people come here for retreats. We like to have people come here and visit. It gives them an opportunity to see what our life is like and also to give them a chance to slow down, to get out of their lives and to just kind of relax a little bit. About three years ago, we started brewing beer here and we sell our beer in a tap room which is located on the property, kind of at the edge of the farm. In the United States, all but three states have actually visited our tap room. But it's more than just our, our beer. People come in and they have the opportunity to buy monk-made products like woodworking, our hot sauce. We have peanut brittle down there. The brewery has every possibility 
of being something that will actually help to support the monastery. I'm very much in favor of trying to do things that will help support us. Brother Sebastian, we are at the very first stage of brewing some beer. So what are we? what is going on right now? So we're getting ready to grind the grains that we're gonna to use to make our amber beer. This is a uh, caramel 100 grain. So we're gonna grind it and we're gonna break it apart so that when we put it in the pot to seep, it'll have an opportunity to, to convert the starches into sugars. It's gonna be loud, isn't it? It's gonna be a little bit loud. Okay. And here we go. What we've got here now are all those grains that have been ground together and you can see how they, the holes have just opened up and that'll help it convert that to sugar a lot faster. How often do you guys brew? We try to brew three to four times a week. Last year's sales kind of help us drive that number. Everybody knows last year in March when the COVID really kind of hit its first peak, we decided as a, a monastery talking with our abbot that it would probably be best for us to shut down the brewery for a little while and uh, to kind of see what was happening in the community. So we decided to do that. And uh, we actually stayed completely shut down until mid-June. And then this past weekend, we opened back up. So we were completely open inside seating, being able to drink pints on the property, not just outside. And it was a really good response. So I'm out in the garden and I'm surrounded by these beautiful pepper plants. Right now it's still a little early in the season, but in just a few days, these will all be full of fabulous habanero peppers. Since 2003, the monks here have created a flaming hot sauce called monk sauce. Father Richard Walls' love for habanero peppers began in South America and followed him to Arkansas. These are smoked and frozen from last season, right? Right. We grow the peppers here from seed that I brought from Belize 18 years ago. I did spend a good number of years in the country of Belize because Subiaco was trying to start a monastery. These things in vinegar tend to blow up like little balloons, and so I like to just cut them in half and put them in the pot to get ready to make uh, some monk sauce because we want to try to make a little bit here, right? Sure. All right. Absolutely. So we cut everything up, boil it, and then... And then blend it. That is a monk holding two bottles with three X's on them and fire coming out of his ears. So that makes me feel very confident. <laughs> right. You want to try it on a cracker? And I'm trying the smoked. The smoked, right. I'm already crying. Oh! <gasps> Mmm, maybe you want more than you think. Wow. That's what I That's think. good. Mm -hmm. But the heat's good. I think you've got a good thing here. It is good. You, you've yeah. got a good thing here. That's right. Well, I think that Arkansas is lucky and happy that you came back and brought your hobby and peppers. I'm happy to. <laughs> right. You brought the peppers with me. Woohoo! You don't necessarily need to have hundreds of acres to provide an Arkansas agricultural experience. I'm at Urbana Farmstead, just outside of Little Rock, where Margie Ramondo has created a true urban oasis. I am Margie Ramondo. I'm the chef and the farmer here at Urbana Farmstead. This farmstead has a market, a farm, and a kitchen. Well, there in the market we sell not only the produce that we grow here and a few other local farmers, but we also do some of the value-add things like canned things, pickled things, preserves, and apothecary products. Agritourism is an opportunity for me to share my farm and also all the experiences around the farm. You like to literally cut herbs yep. for someone when they come out here if that's, that's right. what they if want. If somebody wants an herb, I'll just figure out how much they want and I will literally cut it for them when it's time. What I like about this little area is it's got a little bit of everything. So mm -hmm. I've got the herbs, I have the purslane. One thing the pandemic did is it brought us all back to the memories of how it used to be. When we all had gardens or when your grandparents had gardens or when your grandparents had chickens run around. And so people wanted to get close to that life again. They, they brought back memories. But what it did is it helped me shape the, what I was doing here because I realized, well, geez, I've lived that life, partly out of necessity as a child when we were very poor as an immigrant family, and partly when I trained as a chef on farms doing preservation. And I'm like, well, here it is. This is the voice of Urbana Farmstead. 
And the best part is it's less than an acre. It's urban, it's very urban. It used to be a junkyard that we converted into a farm. And I tell people all the time, you don't need 12 acres of rolling hills. You don't need that. So here is where you put your own spin on the Three Sisters. That's right. Tell me about that. Well, the Three Sisters is typically squash and then a bean and also some kind of corn. But I decided that I was gonna add sunflowers. Sunflowers are such happy plants. And so I thought, why not? If the sisters are happy, let's throw a cousin in there. So. <laughs> but I just love to combine things that are, number one, are companion plants. So they help each other grow. They may nurture each other with nutrition or they may help with pest management. You have put your fingerprint on a lot of things out here. It's a, it's a really neat space. You have a lot of visitors year round. Yes. They come out here um, for your market, but then also to learn from you and to purchase some of your goods. It's just a big circle. You're using everything and you're not wasting anything and you're sharing it with everybody. It's all about building community. It's not just my community of plants but it's also sharing my knowledge and my, the things that I've learned along the way with other people. Most of our families have farmed in some fashion, whether it's your parents or grandparents, just go back. I mean, that was the way of life, right? So I'm lucky because my family in Sicily still farms. We come from a farming family. Um, we grow grapes and we make wine, where Raimondo is a family winery in Sicily, but we also grow vegetables and fruits. Every time I go back and I try to spend about a month a year there, of course, my family packs food and seeds. Yeah. <laughs> so it's great when you can preserve the seeds as a generation to generation and then see them flourish. It's like this place is my, all my little passions all in one little compound. Arkansas agritourism comes in many shapes and forms, whether it's having a cold brew with country monks or learning how to live a healthy and happier life, you're sure to find an Arkansas farmer to glean from. For Good Roots, I'm Lauren McCullough. And that concludes our program for Arkansas Week. I'm Dawn Scott, thanks for being with us. We'll see you next week. Support for Arkansas Week provided by the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, the Arkansas Times, and KUAR FM 89.